Hello, I'm Romy Gutierrez, Director of the University Press of Florida, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Thank you for choosing to join us. Today's panel, Race, Environment, Culture, and Political Ecology Across the Americas, is part of a virtual event series made possible by a Sustaining the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We would like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for its support. We would also like to thank our partners at the University of Florida, the African American Studies Program, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere, who have helped us coordinate an exceptional internship program focused on bringing attention and resources to the press's publications in African American Studies and Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And now a few pointers and guidelines for today's panel. This webinar is being recorded. After the webinar, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel, Florida Press. Registrants will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording. Closed captioning has been enabled. To view the closed captioning, please click on closed caption in your meeting controls. If you have a question for the panelists during their presentations, please put your question in the Q&A box. We will pass along your questions to the moderator so they can be addressed in the Q&A session after the panelists have finished their presentations. I would now like to welcome our panel moderator, Dr. Joel Correa, who is assistant professor at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida, where he is the Indigenous Studies Specialization Coordinator. His research examines the intersections of human rights, development, and environmental change with attention to indigenous politics and decolonization. His areas of expertise are Paraguay, the Gran Chaco, and the Southern Cone. Dr. Correa achieved his PhD in geography from the University of Colorado at Boulder. His scholarly articles have been published in the Journal of Latin American Geography, Geoforum, Ethnografías Contemporáneas, and Journal of Peasant Studies, among other academic journals and volumes. He is currently working on a book manuscript tentatively titled Disrupting the Patron, Unsettling Racial Geographies in Pursuit of Indigenous Environmental Justice. And with that, Dr. Correa. Thanks so much for the introduction and for um, inviting me to uh, moderate this session. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to share this time and space with our wonderful panelists as well. And really excited that the NEH has supported this panel and this important conversation that we're going to be having today. The panel today is titled Race, Environment, Culture, and Political Ecology Across the Americas. And the topic opens an important site for questions about the politics of human environment relations, unequal power, injustice, and struggles for more just futures, grassroots resistance, and much more. And that said, I want to take a moment to think what the history is from the place uh, of the place from which I speak today as it relates not only to the panel theme, but ongoing struggles for justice in the Americas. The city of Gainesville and the University of Florida sit on the ancestral and, and uh, traditional territories of the Timuqua, Miccosukee, Potano, and Seminole peoples that are also important sites of trade and transit for other indigenous peoples prior to colonization. This land bears the history of those peoples, their removals and lasting efforts by indigenous peoples to maintain relations with these territories. An acknowledgement of the sort offers a reflection on the histories and contemporary politics of this place, including those that intersect with legacies of slavery. And while wholly inadequate to reconcile with these issues, land acknowledgements also ask us to learn more about these topics and how each of us wants to engage them. The April 2022 report of the Presidential Task Force on African American and Native American History in the University of Florida provides a detailed objective account where you can learn more if you are interested. And I'm gonna drop a link to that in the chat right now. If I can. So now I have the honor to introduce our four wonderful panelists today. And I'm going to begin with Dr. Sophie Sapp Moore. She is the Deluvial Houston Postdoctoral Fellow in Environmental Justice at the Center for Environmental Studies and Humanities Research Center at Rice University. Dr. Moore's research focuses on political ecology, environmental justice, critical geography, environmental humanities, and Caribbean studies. She earned her PhD in cultural studies and critical theory from the University of California, Davis. Dr. Moore has published articles in Gender, Place, and Culture, the Journal of Political Ecology, Architectural Review, and the Journal of Environmental Education. 
She also has a book chapter, Kakos and Cotton, Unmaking Imperial Geographies on Haiti's Central Plateau, appearing next month in an edited collection entitled Global Plantations in the Modern World. She is currently working on a book manuscript tentatively titled Freedom's Ground. We also have Dr. Alex A. Moulton, who is assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, a joint faculty assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Sustainability, and a fellow at the Center for Study of Social Justice at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. His research pursues critical understandings of human environment processes within the context of global social environmental change uh, with emphasis on climate change, environmental justice, reparations, black ecologies, and the historical geographies of colonization and marinage in the Caribbean. Dr. Moulton earned his PhD in geography from Clark University. His scholarly work has appeared in Environment and Planning D and E, the Journal of Political Ecology, Environment and Society, Geography Compass, as well as other academic journals and edited volumes. Dr. Moulton serves as the chair of the Caribbean Geography Specialty Group for the American Association of Geographers. Dr. Miguel Rojas Sotelo is adjunct professor in International and Comparative Studies, uh, Environmental Communication and Sustainability at Duke University, where he is also the Special Events Coordinator for the Duke University Center for Latin American Studies and the Director of the NCLA Film Festival. Dr. Rojas Sotelo works at the intersection of ethnic and indigenous studies, environmental and health humanities, critical human geography, and border cultural theory. He achieved his PhD in contemporary cultural theory, Latin American, and visual studies from the University of Pittsburgh, his recent publications include articles in scholarly journals such as Alternativas, a Latin American cultural studies journal. He's also published several books, including Irrupciones, Compresiones y Contravenciones, Arte Contemporáneo y Política Cultural en Colombia. His current book project is tentatively titled Territorio Incorporado, Ejercicios de Soberanía Visual, Visualidades, Textualidades y Estetéticas Situadas en la Producción Artística Indígena en Abya Yala. And finally, we have Dr. Willie J. Wright, who is assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Florida. He is also a 2022 scholar in residence at the Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning at Rice University. His research focuses on black studies, black geographies, spatial theory, urban studies, public art, and social movements. Dr. Wright earned his PhD in geography from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His scholarly work has appeared in Antipode, Environments and Planning D, ACME, and City and Society, uh, among other journals and edited volumes. His current book projects include a monograph entitled On Live Oak and Hallman, Place and Public Art in Houston's Third Ward, as well as an edited collection, Consumer Political Economy and African-American Slavery and Post-Modernity. So I'm uh, confident we're gonna have an amazing conversation today. I'm really excited about this wonderful group of panelists and scholars. And I would very much like to invite Dr. Sophie Sapp Moore to begin our conversation. Just remind everyone that you'll have 10 minutes for your presentations. We're going to hold a conversation at the end of that and then open it up to broader questions and answers uh, or discussion with the, with the audience. So thanks so much for, for attending, for all those who are here with us today. And Dr. Sophie Sapp Moore, I'd like to pass the microphone over to you now. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and to University Press of Florida um, for the invitation and Amich, of course, for the opportunity. And thank you to y'all in the audience for attending. So I have a few slides for you. I am going to share my screen. All right. What is the opposite of a plantation? You might think of the selva of the Amazon or of the swamps along the Gulf Coast Bayou or the mountains that surround the alluvial valleys of Puerto Rico, Haiti, or Jamaica. There are plantations, specific places that are always bordered with fugitive geographies, but there's also the plantation, an idea, a process, a set of extractive relations that is fundamental to capitalism. In this talk, I want to reflect on the unmaking of the plantation and of plantations. My time is limited today, so I'm gonna focus on Haiti and specifically the center island region where I've long worked. But I'm doing so in order to root a model of what I call counter plantation life. Along with Haitian sociologist, Sean Casimir, I see the counter plantation as a concept that helps us to think about how the fund fundamental violence of the Americas is unmade. I mentioned extraction, which I want to think through in the agrarian context of colonial and post-colonial Hispaniola. 
Ruth Wilson Gilmore, expanding on Cedric Robinson, teaches us that capitalism, which developed in tandem with extractive agriculture, is never not racial. All capitalism is racial capitalism. As a political ecologist, my work examines how power shapes environments. I also explore the political ecology of the unmaking of power and the forms that agrarian justice can take in its unmaking. One of those forms is embedded in the set of relations that practitioners call agroecology, a practice of sustainable small farming. Since 2012, my work in Haiti has been with peasants organized in the Mouvement Paysan Papay, MPP, a Via Campesina movement that advocates for agroecological farming and food sovereignty. The farmers and organizers I know in Papay, a small village near the provincial capital of Anche, make clear that the land itself, this soil that was once a Spanish colony, is the ground of their liberatory politics. I want to start off by sharing a story with you from the time I spent as a student in MPP's agroecology training cycle. Mackinson's back straightens and his gaze sharpens as he meets the eyes of each student seated in an arc around him. He paces in the middle of the circle of benches. His intense gaze demands students' attention and he raises his chin and narrows his eyes as he says emphatically, our politics is called agroecology. His usually placid smile is sharpened and his wiry body is tense as he turns around to look at the circle of students. He adds indignantly, we have nothing to do with people who prepare their soil with herbicide. Do you understand? That's their politics. It's a choice, but we don't believe in it. It's not in heaven that we work, but here Nante, on earth. Mackinson is an agronomist and a trainer with MPP. Today's lesson was on soil fertility. and comes near the end of a 10 month training cycle in agroecology. Soon the 20 or so women and men who fill the classroom will graduate and return to their homes in villages all over Haiti's interior. Most will work small plots of land where they cultivate the same crops their ancestors have grown for generations. Maize, millet, peanuts, beans, manioc, sugarcane, and yams. Over the past months, we've completed units on biodiversity, seed selection, and soil conservation, but we didn't start there. The first unit was on political economy, and the second was on organizing for social change. When Mackinson reminds the class that it is not in heaven that we work, but here on earth, he's making a claim about what it means to live a radical life here in this place. In MPP, agroecology is a politics that both emerges from a particular history and enacts a particular future. Gade Poué, look and see. Mackinson had urged the class earlier. If you can't take a soil sample to the laboratory, ask elders for the histoire, ask them for the story of the earth. He holds his hands out side by side with palms cupped upward. Ask them, what can this soil do? The narrative you're most likely to hear about Haiti is one of deprivation, devastation, and environmental and social disorder. Yet my friends in Papai, hold close a vision of an abundant earth. That vision is at once of a fruitful future to come and of an agrarian world in the making. For militants and MPP, the struggle continues jusqu'à victoire finale, until the final victory. When I ask my friend, I'll call him Wilson, what such a victory might entail, he laughs. Why the land of milk and honey, he exclaims smiling broadly and sweeping a hand in a wide arc in front of him. The transformation that the final victory entails is the accumulation of a process of change that began in 1791. That history is one that MPP's agroecologists understand as rooted in the soil itself, in the histories and in the futures that it holds. And spending time with my friends in Papai, I think a lot about how agrarian struggle establishes a horizon for the future, roots a certain kind of futurity in land and in relations around it. To conclude, I want to share one more story that for me shows that future in the making. One afternoon in April, 
a few weeks into the spring rainy season, I hurry across a steep hillside behind my friend Jonas. His garden spreads across a small valley surrounded by raw faced cliffs and the greenery that hangs over the ankle deep Samana River. It's far from the road, tucked into a narrow crease between the hills. Jonas shows me how to poke a stick into the clumped earth and to place in it a manioc cutting, a smooth straight stick about three inches long. He chops all the rocky soil with his hoe, moving steadily across the hillside, the divots evenly spaced. I shuffle behind him, barefoot, sweating in the hot mid-morning sun, crouching as I place each cutting. I'm nervously making sure the tiny points that will become each plant's branches are pointing up so they can reach for the sun. The soil is still damp from yesterday's rain and our bare feet are sticky with reddish earth. When each hole is filled with a trio of knob sticks resting just barely below the earth's surface, we head down the hillside back towards the road. We weave between stands of banana, mango, and papaya trees as we make our way through carpets of dark green yam and delicate peanut plants in the sandy soil. Jonas's house is about 20 minutes walk from his garden. This too is surrounded by green. Around his house, Jonas grows eggplants, onions, peppers, and tomatoes, as well as forage for his goats. We sit in straight back chairs in his small front room, and we eat boiled manioc root from last season's crop off of tin plates. We're eating the same food that Jonas's ancestors planted in provision grounds in maroon gardens on the land that Jonas's father inherited from his father. Jonas's life is hard. It's not just. But when my friend shows me how to loosen the sticky clay soil to give the manioc space to grow, I remember Mackinson's question, what can this soil do and think of futures otherwise? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful paper. I'm looking forward to the conversations and questions that come from it. And I'd like to invite Dr. Alex Moulton, uh, to present his paper in defense of the heartland Mar maroon resurgence, environmentalism and contested development in Jamaica. Thank you. Let me try to share my screen here. All right, I'm gonna assume that that's, that's working properly. So it is 2017, massive excavation equipment scaffolding around steel and concrete, mounds of earth and backfill material. Jamaican laborers, Chinese supervisors and signage announcing road works in progress characterize my entry into the Kingston and St. Andrew metropolitan area. The work being done uh, seems to signal the imaginary that motivates the politics of the moment. The roads into the corporate area are the arteries of prosperity. Uh, the, this is the tagline of the wholeness Jamaica Labor Party administration, prosperity time now. And this seems to signal a turn towards these mega infrastructure projects um, that are aimed at improving the infrastructural network of the island and increase the economic profile of the island as well. Mandela Highway, Three Miles, Hadley Park Road, Constant Spring Road, the Junction Main Road, all these major roads are all under expansion and realignment at the same time. It is a massive undertaking. The simultaneity of the construction, the scale of the collective undertaking um, would seem to be most removed from the deteriorated roads and economic decline of rural Jamaica. However, the communities most distant from the construction, spatially and metaphorically, are actually central to the politics that underwrite the construction taking place. These communities, especially the Maroon communities, Maroon settlements on the edge of Jamaica's forests are buffer communities, buffer communities of the uh, islands protected areas, but also buffer communities uh, to the insobriety, I would argue, of the state's conservation and development ag agenda. So conservation is central to this positioning of the island at the same time as uh, this uh, construction is taking place. And here, I just have a series of images that are going to be on loop and um, hopefully will, will, will make sense um, as I get through the presentation. So indeed, th this mantra of modernity and progress carries a, a mandate to conserve. 
uh, these very pristine areas that these buffered communities are on the sort of fringes of. So modernity demands the preservation of, of, of Jamaica's patrimony, the preservation of these ecologically sensitive areas, at the same time that these construction projects are bringing about new development. And so uh, uh, to borrow from Sylvia Winter, we might understand these realities as this sort of jaundice faced realities of the new world in the wake of 1492. The politics of these buffer communities, I argue, uh, challenge the state's ability to impose its will. These roads and bridges signal the state's willingness, interest in bringing development, while these protected areas and the politics of these protected areas hail the state's ineffectiveness as re at, at really marshalling environmental stewardship. And so what I want to do is to kind of read this moment of, con of conjuncture or read the convergence of this sort of increased maroon activism um, in response to uh, the, the, the sort of hyper-construction um, being met with also uh, an interest in conservation that's taking place in 2017, to read that as a moment of conjuncture that really allows us to think about the renegotiation of maroon identity, the articulation of notions of, uh, of, of ancestrality, but also uh, significant and nuanced critiques of development that really question the Jamaica's future, while at the same time re-narrating the historical memory and uh, formation of the island. So I, I, I want to skip maybe a little bit here um, to, to, to not provide a history of Boxai, but to, but to say that this conjuncture was centered upon the Coptic country, right? Uh, primarily concerned with the Akompong town Maroons, who are the sort of chief, uh, uh, arguably only remaining Maroon polity, um, from the original windward leeward maroon um, uh, group. So this this conjuncture involved the Jamaica Environmental Trust um, and the uh, South, Southeastern Trelawney um, Environmental Agency. The cockpit country is Jamaica's uh, one of Jamaica's largest reservoir of uh, of, of water, um, and providing some something like forty percent of Jamaica's underground water resources uh, to about forty percent of the island's six western parishes. Uh, the area is characterized by karst uh, uh, limestone geology, which means that there's no surface rivers, but subterranean waterways that wind their way through a, a sort of labyrinthine complex of, of streams and sinkholes, aquifers, and underground drainage channel, channels. So as the island's largest remaining contiguous forest, the cockpit country is also a biodiversity hotspot. The area is habitat to uh, 28 of the island's 29 endemic species, 69 resident breeding birds and 71 um, uh, endemic, endemic species, uh, endemic plant species. The Maroons are, uh, for those who might not be familiar, descended from enslaved and free Africans who established uh, autonomous communities in these hard to reach uh, interior places of Jamaica going back to the 1600s. So, so these groups have increasingly become central to Jamaican political geography. And one of the things I'm arguing is that at every juncture where Jamaica's political identity, political future, political geography is being negotiated, the Maroons enter the discourse. And, and this is no different in 2017, right? And so in 2017, the Jamaica Environmental Trust, the Southeastern uh, Trelawney Environmental Agency, and the Maroons have this moment of realignment. At that time, following over maybe a decade or so of rumors um, and the awarding of prospecting licenses for bauxite mining, um, it became clear that the government would have been inclined to promote or allow the extraction of, of bauxite in the cockpit country. So this coalition of environmentalists and Maroons sort of launched a petition for the protection of the cockpit country, the declaration of, of a cockpit country protected area. The petition also called for an end to uh, prospecting um, and a, you know, the sort of elimination of any possibility of, 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 of uh, further mining. The petition was the first test of a newly launched Jamaica House petition system, uh, Jamaica House being a sort of metonym for Jamaica's sort of executive branch. Um, so the, the, the Save the Cockpit Country petition targeted 15,000 signatures. The petition was removed from the uh, from the website, uh, it was, was deactivated a few days before it was closed um, because of alleged suspicion. And this signals something of the sort of overwhelming nature of the interest in the petition and also the success the petition was having. And so days before the petition was to close on September 22, over 12,477 signatures had already signed the petition, again with a target of 
of 15,000, right? And so by the end of the campaign, something like 20,955 folks had signed this petition. I want to read this victory of the petition as a result of the intersection of a number of strategic efforts, right? A clever discursive and symbolic mapping of the cockpit country as Jamaica's heartland, a re-narration of the, the sort of Maroon's revolutionary history as a people's history, a dazzlingly impressive national origin story, which had culminated in securing out the cockpit as a territory for freedom, right? And this territory in this re-narration was bequeathed to the, to, to, to the Maroons and to other Jamaicans, both born and unborn, as a kind of um, 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 sort of patrimony, right? And so this kind of re-narration, I'm arguing, makes the cockpit country publicly accessible and relatable for people who otherwise would probably not have an interest um, and sort of retabulated, using a sort of language of accounting here, the sort of socio-ecological benefits of the cockpit country and, and thereby casting into sharp relief the, uh, the sort of devastating impacts that mining would have on the cockpit country. So this heartland description, I'm arguing, situated the cockpit country as Jamaica's symbolic and ecological center, right? As a kind of the island's Amazon rainforest, right? Um, it was a cradle for yam production, which is the primary domestic start. And all of these were, were, were brought to the fore. Uh, it, was, it was noted, for example, that Usain Bolt grew up in the shadow of the cockpit country and much ecotourism derives from the sort of specific socioecology of the cockpit country. This framing articulated through a public media campaign that included um, one of television advertisements, including um, this young lady here, elicited broad, elicited broad national interest, right? Um, and the, 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 the conservation of the heartland was placed front of center in sort of civic dis, dis, discussion and kept there by frequent media appearances of uh, leading supporters of the Maroon, by environmentalists, and also by, by uh, regular protests which brought about a broad coalition of Jamaicans. So Rastafarians showed up, folks who showed up with, with signs saying, you know, Jesus of Nazareth died for us and Jamaica should protect the cockpit country. So a really sort of um, a, a bringing together of a, a huge swath of stakeholders who perhaps would otherwise not have a line. Um, reggae artists and, and dance hall musicians also voiced support for the cockpit country. Um, I'll read one of the, the quotes here from uh, Bounty Killer, uh, who's uh, one of the leading um, uh, uh, musicians locally. He says, any government who sells out the cockpit country shall never win again in Jamaica. Who is here for Jamaica? Let Una voices be heard. Take a stand. Either you're with us or you're against us. Now, again, the cockpit country has never appeared in, uh, you know, reggae music. There's, there's never been a sort of discussion of the cockpit country in these kinds of ways. Maroon leaders and promoters of Maroon cultural heritage also recounted the accounts of the hero Maroon resistance to colonization. The original leaders of the Maroon revolt against British colonialism were, were re-remembered through public statements as forerunners who, undaunted by the might of Imperial Britain, had lost their life and limb to secure this land of the cockpit country and also the freedom um, to live and use uh, this cockpit country. So the red dirt of the cockpit country, this sort of aluminum rich soil was, was as it were in these narrations stained by the ancestors blood who must now be allowed to rest in peace from the encroachment of bauxite mining, right? And so in so doing the, the sort of Maroons and Afro Jamaicans um, who followed them in the establishment of free villages in the cockpit uh, community uh, were, were narrativized as early practitioners of sustainability, right? In stark contrast to the kind of developmental agenda wrapped up in what bauxite has been used for primarily um, during World War uh, II uh, to, to, to make light aircraft uh, to carry on the war effort, but then also uh, to, to be associated with the sort of shining symbols of American suburban um, development the aluminum siding, the aluminum roof, roof, Reynolds aluminum wrap, and the sort of other light popular consumable electronics that are produced from alumina. And so the, the argument was that the, the, the cockpit country is first and foremost uh, the, the thing that the ancestors has bequeathed to the Maroons who, who presently live, but that that should now be broadly accessible. And there were a number of public statements 
um, uh, to that effect as well. So woven into the arguments was also a very clear political economic rationale for conservation, right? So the conservationists, the environmentalists were, were pretty adept at articulating that further mining would, would be profitable for, for only perhaps a generation, would cause great degradation and so on, and would actually undermine the state's interest in um, payment for ecosystem services uh, programming, right? The, the Save the Cockpit petition and the continuing and intensifying visibility of an increasingly militant maroon environmental movement, I'm arguing, has provoked a reevaluation of the historiography of not just marronage, but the nation itself. These framings were and continue, right? Um, and, and, and so what I want to do is to suggest that there is a considerable worth in thinking through this moment of, con of conjuncture and what is it, what it has enabled, right? A critique of the states, um, a sort of vision of development, and a reevaluation of the futurities that are possible in places like Jamaica. But what I want to zero in, perhaps for the rest of, of, of the time I have, is the importance of this emergent notion of ancestrality that was art being articulated. So that ancestrality seems to have remained, emerged and remained a sort of key component, component of this work of visioning and remembering. The ancestors loom large in the collective consciousness and inform a sense of place, a sense of community, um, that is deeply rooted in a respect for the struggle for freedom, right? In, the, in, in, in this land, the Maroon see the blood of their ancestors as a kind of lamination of the years of struggle that now texture this space that uh, is being sort of devalued um, through just this sort of political economy of, of bauxite production. And so it is this, this sort of weighty respect for the ancestors that imbues uh, the, the kinds of political coalitions that emerge in this moment. And so, so that it is a, a sort of a, a ethic of communality and a broad redefinition of kinship that places the Maroon community at the center of the nation and places all other Jamaicans within this community with respect to the cockpit country. And so the ancestors here become a kind of social infrastructure upon which is built a constellation of relations and practices. The ancestors are not just dead and buried, but they linger and feature prominently in how we are to understand ourselves. And what emerged out of this, um, and I, I think I'm at time here, so I, I'll, I'll stop sharing. What emerged out of this conversation, for example, are moments in which the Maroons later participate in the inauguration of Jamaica's first Taino chief in 500 years, right? Maroon elders, Post this 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 um, installment on one of the, the the sort of maroon properties, and the ceremonies presided over indigenous peoples from Puerto Rico and North America, but also maroon elders. And so, what I want to do is to suggest that the, the kinds of uh, movements against development that have taken place in Jamaica since this conjuncture around the 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 petition has enabled a sort of um, a reconstitution of environmental consciousness in ways that are profoundly important for how we think about indigeneity and 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 sort of uh, sort of pushing back on the the limits and uh, presumptions about the distinctiveness between blackness, indigeneity, and the potential then of a Caribbean Latin American um, uh, movement for environmental justice justice that is based on um, these kinds of uh, solidarities and redefinitions. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moulton. Wonderful talk. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that uh, please, you can put questions into the Q&A down below that we can draw from and, and bring up with our panelists uh, at the end of the session. But first, I would like to move us over to uh, Dr. Miguel Rojas Sotelo's talk, uh, which will be focusing on transversalities, thinking, doing, and communicating environmental humanity. Um, thank you so much, Joel, and thank you so much, Alex, uh, for that wonderful talk. I hope you are seeing uh, my uh, screen in full mode. Uh, greetings. I'm speaking from the ancestral territories of the Hawaii, Saponi, the Tuscarora, the Soyan, the Cherokee, and the Katawa peoples in North Carolina. I recognize that my institution, Duke University, as an historic and an ongoing participation with settler colonialism. I recognize also that enslaved labor, debt, peonage, 
and the labor of those who do not enjoy the protections of citizenship are part of the history of this place and this institution. I further recognize that server farms are on a stolen land and the energy sources that I'm using to power uh, this communication most adversely affect indigenous and other communities of color. Uh, I'm going to change a little bit the tone here. I was invited to speak about uh, our uh, programs and how they do uh, transversally connect issues of uh, race, uh, environmentalism, uh, and uh, knowledge. Then uh, this short talk is uh, titled Transversal Transversality is Thinking, Doing, Communicating Environmental Humanities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I work at the Duke Center for Latin American Studies for the past uh, 14 years. Uh, and ever since we have been committed to approach the diversity of intellectual production, both academic and non-academic from a multiple, multiple platform in which programming, conferences, roundtables, webinars, exhibitions, uh, classes, even they become performances, they become media, they become an archive, but in multiple formats. The idea behind here is to address knowledge production with the multiplicity of experiences taking place in Latin America and the Caribbean, from embodied, ritualistic, or as we say it in Spanish, formas encarnadas, uh, also uh, to conventional uh, schol uh, scholastic ones, establishing bridges of communication and exchange. My personal vision uh, for the nexus on race, the environment, and the humanities from an academic institution in the United States dealing with Latin America and the Caribbean is to see an increased focus on three overlapping areas. First, uh, a holistic critical theory, uh, what we would call true humanities, holistic views of the world, specifically the union of natural and cultural critical studies, natural sciences and cultural critical studies. Second, critical pedagogy, particularly the merging of natural and cultural studies pedagogies, including efforts towards recognizing teaching as an action and the expansion of the classroom as a field of opportunities and decolonizing the classroom via intercultural encounters where holistic and critical environmental education takes place. We can do that, uh, third, by helping cultural revival, uh, helping the fight for Mother Earth, uh, helping cultural and natural conservation and stewardship, including critical analysis of issues like resource management, rel relationality, and life cycle assessment and action. It is the primary task of this vision to foster critical examinations in, of, and within all these three, three aspects equally. Going forward, however, uh, efforts must be increasingly be made to move beyond what many times what we do, eco-criticism uh, sitting behind a desk, to eco-action, mobilizing change on the ground, be it in the form of actively underlying new and diverse sources of knowledge, what we call the embodied archive, El Archivo Encarnado, spreading counter narratives by allowing human, non-human and beyond human voices to resonate with the hope of rebuilding healthy communities and healthy environments. This is of course, not a small undertaking. And some of these reflections are derived from an amazing uh, scholar, Rich uh, Hutchins, uh, who wrote back in 2014 in the Journal for Environmental Humanities, uh, a, a vision uh, for uh, EH. Then after more than 10 years of work, um, we have a number of processes, academic and else, uh, that I uh, wanna share. 
and we can discuss. Uh, this vision grew out of uh, what we uh, call at the time in hemispheric indigeneity in global terms, a project founded by the Andrew Mellon uh, Foundation, a grant uh, in uh, 2013, and the Abhi Ajala Working Group, uh, another uh, series of uh, if, um, uh, projects uh, founded by Title VI uh, and that are part of the consortium that we host uh, with uh, University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill. Some of you are part of that. And Duke, uh, this working group took place from 2014 to 2021. Uh, that uh, look at the resilience of native and indigenous communities in, in Abhi Ayala their marginality, but also their centrality uh, after cen centuries of uh, negligence, persecution, repression, and the attempts of integration. This project, this both projects, Hemispheric Indigenous in Global Terms and, and the Abhi Ajala Working Group became a scholarly perspective uh, that in comparative and contextual fashion, uh, we're looking at indigenous worldviews, in particular, the ones related to self-representation and governmentality sovereignty, as we call it, health and environment, as well as the epistemic tools that allow that allow an ontological reconstitution of being native indigenous in today's global age. Many uh, products have come out of uh, uh, the Hemispheric Indigenous and Global Terms Project and the Abhi Ajala Working Group. Uh, but also this um, vision is an ongoing collaborative uh, series of programs between the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and many departments, units, scholars, students, staff at Duke University and beyond. Uh, one of those uh, is Narrating Nature, uh, part of the Humanities Future Project, another Mellon Foundation uh, initiative that took place from 2014 to 2018 and was administered by the Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke University. And as you know, Duke has been one of the points of origination and is still one of the points in which flows of thinking about the modernity coloniality uh, connects us uh, 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 function and also is the home of the decolonial aesthetics uh, option uh, since 2010. Uh, also, uh, uh, for the, the interdisciplinarity approach uh, to humanities and social sciences, we have been working on issues of race, environment, culture, health, care, uh, and political ecology across the Americas. We have organized exhibitions, symposia, workshops, encounters, uh, not only at Duke University and um, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, but in, uni in other universities in the United States and in Latin America. And most import importantly, we have been working with communities of Abhi Ayala, uh, and we have developed with them multiple publications in multiple formats, uh, and we keep editing and producing our collaborative projects uh, also uh, include the Nicholas School of Environment, uh, one of the prime spaces for the uh, thinking, researching, and doing in related in relation to uh, global change, uh, uh, all change. Uh, also uh, working on issues of conservation, environmental pollution, and environmental uh, justice. Recently. Uh, we have been also working with the environmental peace building, uh, a particularly a project from 2019, 2022, looking at um, the case of Colombia, since uh, the peace agreement uh, signed by the Colombian government and the FARC EP uh, in 2016, peace building efforts have been having a transversal component uh, that is related to the management of the rich environment and the natural resources and uh, the incredible uh, uh, universality and presence of indigenous peoples in, in this uh, South American nation. Uh, this project has been uh, work with people at the Environmental Peace Building Association uh, and the Duke Center for International and Global Studies. Uh, also, to the uh, we we are very grateful to the Global Green Growth Institute uh, and the Environmental Law Institute, bringing also issues 
of environmental law uh, that are taking place in Latin America and that are being followed uh, by attorneys and uh, constitutionalists across the world. The fact that uh, three countries in Latin America uh, include nature and the nature and, and rights for nature in their constitutions is just remarkable. Of course, uh, the environmental peace building project touches on some of uh, uh, the most uh, complex challenges, but also opportunities. Uh, in this case, a study in Colombia uh, on trying to build a peace that is not only among people, but between the non-human and beyond human. Uh, a series of workshops uh, and webinars just like this uh, have been hosted uh, during the pandemic. Uh, an international conference was held finally in person in, in Bogota in 2021. And a major volume uh, was just finished and is going to be published uh, next month by Universidad Externado de Colombia, in which we collect uh, a number, uh, actually 13 approaches to environmental peace building uh, thanks to this project. And of course, we have to recognize uh, Duke Press as a, as a, as a major uh, academic uh, 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 press in, 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 in the United States, uh, helping us uh, through uh, our translation uh, series. Uh, we uh, bring a couple of titles a year from Latin American, translate, and, uh, translate them into English, and then they go into, into the Duke Press collection. But uh, most likely, I wanted to uh, recognize the work of the Environmental Humanities Journal that Duke Press has been uh, managing since 2012. Uh, but also I want to uh, stop here uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the work we have been doing with faculty, students uh, uh, in the U.S. and in many places in the continent. Uh, since 2016, uh, we have been hosting biannual workshops under the banner Mingas de la Imagen. Uh, they take place also in uh, Colombia under uh, the auspice uh, and help of the Universidad Javeriana and the Centro de Estudios Ecocriticos with financial support of the Cultural Conservancy. These encounters with indigenous leaders from many of the more than 100 nations of uh, peoples of Colombia and leaders from many other nations of the continent under the banner Mingas have been proven uh, promising. At the bottom of this initiative is uh, to learn how to work together in a true intercultural collaborative fashion, uh, support indigenous students in their pursuit of higher ed, and to develop alternative methods of knowledge creation, expanding the archive. Um, a couple of months ago, we presented uh, the first uh, collective volume, uh, Mingas de la Imagen, Estudios Indígenas Interculturales, with 48 uh, collaborators from 19 uh, countries, more than 20 indigenous nations, and more than two dozen universities represented. Uh, now, a new editorial line uh, at Ediciones Universidad Javeriana in Colombia has been created to maintain the network and flow uh, of production coming from uh, situated contextual eco-critical and uh, or, or, or literary uh, creators. Uh, and uh, just to finish, this year we're focusing on issues of environmental justice and equity. Uh, we're just building on the legacy of our African American communities resisting environmental injustices in the New South, in particular uh, the communities of Warren and Saxon County in North Carolina, uh, celebrating 40 years of resistance uh, for uh, the better of their lands and their lives uh, that now are, uh, are experienced, you know, uh, uh, also being experienced this this uh, issues by migrant communities working as uh, agricultural uh, workers in the south uh, coming many of them as the new exiles uh, of uh, uh, climate uh, issues in central america and mexico uh, i just want to leave you with uh, this series of images uh, some of the publications that are a result of uh, this uh, share vision. Uh, we have two uh, recent prizes from Casa de las Americas, Ward Mingas. Uh, one of our students, Miguel Rocha Vivas, won this prize uh, three years ago. Professor Emil Keme, uh, also uh, the person behind the Abiyajala Working Group for all these years, won uh, uh, last year 
the Casa de las Americas Prize with Lemaya Katzig. Uh, now he's working on a new monograph, a tentatively titled Avia Yala, a Trans-Hemispheric Indigenous Manifesto, in which he is examining indigenous struggles for self-determination, uh, but also uh, under the uh, banner of um, environmental justice uh, for indigenous uh, uh, migrants and indigenous women uh, and people of LGBTQ2 uh, origin. Uh, and uh, I'm publishing uh, uh, the first monographic work on indigenous eco creators from Avia Yala, titled Territorio Encarnado, as Joel presented first, that will be ready by early spring 2023. Then that's all what I have to uh, share with you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rojas Sotelo. Uh, wonderful initiatives going on at Duke and very interesting to see the connections between a lot of the different themes and topics we've been discussing today. I'm going to ask if you could please uh, stop sharing your screen so that I can invite Dr. Willie J. Wright from the University of Florida to uh, close out our series of conversations and presentations here with uh, his talk, which is titled Life's a Beach. Um, good afternoon. Well, good early evening. Uh, thanks to the University of Florida Press for inviting me to take part in this uh, conversation. I'm gonna deviate from what I normally do and I'm gonna read a, a creative piece that is something between a short story and a script of sorts. Uh, but I think it illustrates well the relationship between race, power, and place uh, in Florida and the importance of epistemologies, particularly critical epistemologies in exposing uh, these realities. <clears throat> um, opening scene, packing last remaining items in the truck before heading to Cedar Key, Florida. John's partner with whom he has a long distance romance has flown in for the week and the couple are excited. They are looking forward to some time on the beach given they both had a difficult time at their jobs. John closes truck tailgate. I believe that's everything, let's roll. Did you pack the sunscreen? Done. And the beach towels? Yep. What about my salt and vinegar chips? Yeah, I packed those nasty things. I still don't understand why you eat them because they're good. Now then, let's roll. Cut to scene and the couple are already on a long stretch of road that leads to Cedar Key. <clears throat> John's partner, Alice, there sure, there sure is a lot of flags around here. You know what they say, behind every flag is a good American patriot. How about we play a game? What did you have in mind? I don't know, something. Hmm. How about we play spot the flag? Spot the flag, what's that? That's when each, that's when e that's when we each point out when one of us sees an American flag or a Trump 2024 flag or a thin blue line flag. It's a combination of slug bug and capture the flag. So you mean whenever we see a flag, cause that's all we're gonna see. Not exactly, but technically, yes. Whenever we see either flag, we point it out. At the end of the trip, we'll add them up and see how many there were. So you want to play? Uh, I guess. <clears throat> Bam, there's an American flag. One point for me. Oh, look, there's a thin blue line and a Trump 2024 flag. There's got to be extra points for that. There is. I drive faster. They both chuckle. After some time, the duo passes a Black couple on the opposite side of the road. They appear, they appear to be reading something. <clears throat> Alice becomes curious and suggests they stop on their way back from the beach. Hey, I wonder what they're looking at. And in the middle of nowhere at that, it looks to be some kind of marker. Maybe we should stop on our way back. John, we spent the last 20 minutes playing spot the flag, most of which have been homages to Trump and this country's murderous police brigade. And you want to stop on the side of this country road to look at a sign? Yes. And here I thought I was the researcher. If you're scared, just say that. I'm not scared. I'm just hyper aware of my surroundings. <clears throat> Pulling up to Cedar Key. Um, how did you say you heard about this place again? One of my coworkers said tight lipped. Flashback to Falcucci retreat. John is outside by himself, broiling on a humid summer day. 
He's taking in the scenery, an empty and rather placid lake, when a colleague stands beside him. I wouldn't go swimming in there if I were you. It's full of gators. John gives him a sideways glance as, as he had no intention to swim in the lake and had no, de no desire to engage in conversation. But what the hell? Where would you go swimming then? Me? Well, I have a boat, so I go to Cedar Key. It's like an hour from here. Hmm. <clears throat> Cut back to scene at Cedar Key. Annoyed by this beachless beach, John is, e is made even more frustrated by the memory of the uninvited exchange. I think it's time we head back home, don't you? Alice, I've been ready. Disappointed with Cedar Key, the couple make their way back to town. As they drive, they, they glimpse a sign for the town of Sumner, Florida. Not long after, Alice points out the totem ahead. They pull over. The sign is draped in all kinds of offerings, faded Mardi Gras beads, plastic flowers, a surgical mask. They approach it silently, almost with caution. Neither say a word. <clears throat> Both begin to read. The camera is focused on them and the sign, then just the sign. As the lens zooms in, the duo is drawn into the sign, transfixed by it and the history it tells. As they read, their ears are assaulted by the roar of large trucks and a clan of motorcycles passing by at high rates of speed. Some honk their horns. You just know they're all white. The marker reads as follows, quote, racial violence erupted in the small and quiet Rosewood community January 1st through 7th, 1923. Rosewood, a predominantly colored community was home to the Bradley, Carrier, Carter, Goins and Hall families, among others. Residents supported a school taught by Mahulda Gussie Brown Carrier, three churches, and a Masonic Lodge. Many of them owned their homes, some were business owners, and others worked in nearby Sumner and at the Comer, the Comer Lumber Mill. This quiet life came to an end on January 1st, 1923, when a white Sumner woman accused a black man of assaulting her. In the search for her alleged attacker, whites terrorized and killed Rosewood residents. In the days of fear and violence that followed, many Rosewood citizens sought re refuge in the nearby woods. White merchant, and, white merchant John M. Wright and other courageous whites sheltered some of the fleeing men, women, and children. Whites burned Rosewood and looted livestock and property. Two were killed while attacking a home. Five Blacks also lost their lives. Sam Carter, who was tortured for information and shot to death on January 1st, Sarah Carrier, Lexi Gordon, James Carrier, and Mingo Williams. Those who survived were forever scarred, unquote. Um, <clears throat> so that's all that I have of that written piece, but I, I wrote that shortly after visiting Cedar Key, I guess, obviously. Uh, and I wanted to read it because I felt it illustrates the connection between white supremacist logics, the, the violence of white supremacist logics in the past and uh, white ignorance in the presence, right? But it also signifies the intersection of like race and place and power. Um, so a couple of things that have been on my mind since that experience is uh, one, a, a colleague suggesting that I go to Cedar Key. And for this particular person, Cedar Key is just a place of leisure. And like for me, visiting Cedar Key was being assaulted visually by all these flags. Uh, reading this sign, uh, I recall having a conversation with a separate colleague about a, a geographies of Black Florida class that I've been imagining and thinking about these different landscapes. Uh, and this particular colleague, had no idea about Rosewood. And they used their international status as a reason for why they didn't know about Rosewood, despite the fact that they've been at the institution for at least a decade. Uh, and so it, these experiences got me thinking about epistemologies of violence and how white ignorance is tied to white rage in the past and present. Uh, and moreover, I'm, thinking about a project that looks to kind of unearth who owns the land that was once 
Rosewood, right? Because there's a clear sign for Sumner, Florida, as you make your way to and from Cedar Key. Uh, but the only thing that signifies that Rosewood existed was the state marker. However, I know <clears throat> that the land that was owned by the carriers and the carters is now a part of someone else's privately owned land. And so I'm trying to figure out a way how to do that digging um, to further illustrate how anti-Black violence is one, a precursor for capital accumulation, right? Uh, and in the case of the United States has been essential to the, the transfer of intergenerational wealth amongst white, uh, lower and middle-class white families. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wright. I think it's super, it's a really powerful um, reflection and also analysis that you've shared with us. And it pushes us forward and I think some really productive and important ways that resonates with several of the, uh, the talks today and also comes back full circle to the question of place and where we are at least you and I are speaking from and thinking about um, the, the histories and contemporary politics that, that those types of uh, situations, experiences and events draw us to reflect upon, but also think about action towards in the future. So I'd like to invite everyone, uh, all the panelists to please turn on your cameras and, and return so we could perhaps have a conversation in the next um, 13 or so minutes that remain. A lot of really powerful presentations here today and. My role is not to um, to comment on all of the papers per se, uh, but really I'd like to just open up a conversation across uh, your wonderful presentations and, and what you have put out there for us to think about. There's several different things that, uh, some quick themes that kind of just came to my mind were questions of embodiment from being there in place uh, on the beach or non-beach in Cedar Key to planting of manioc. Uh, to actual uh, embodied resistance and the different kinds of art forms and knowledge production that's going on at Duke University, thinking about the ways in which embodiment is practiced and experienced across these different sites. Across all of these papers, I see uh, much to do with temporality and thinking about the, not only the reconciling with and, and struggling with histories, but thinking about futurity, futurity, futurity and what that means, what that has to do with resistance, what that has to do with a sum of called resilience and also what that has to do with joy and reimagining how narratives are told and, and who is telling these narratives and what that has to do as well, even with uh, the question of white rage and epistemology in epistemologies of ignorance. I think that has much to do with this question of temporality as well. Um, of course, extractivism in many different forms comes up across all of the papers, uh, not only the labor of folks, but also um, specifically drawing from the earth itself and, and the reimagining of places for the form of capital accumulation as it takes in all of these different sites. So just kind of throw that out there and uh, invite you all to please jump in and, and have a cross conversation with one another unless you need would like more kind of prodding, but I, I don't think that would be necessary. So I'm gonna step back and, and open the floor. And thank you again for all these wonderful presentations. Oh, thank you, Joel. What can I say? I, I think that um, everybody is on the same page. And really, thank you so much for, for, for that reading. I, I, I really uh, uh, felt that, 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 yeah, we are somehow from our own positionalities in, uh, in higher education, in, in, in big academic institutions, uh, trying to find a, a way to, to to incorporate into what we do uh, relations, right? And these relations are not only human relations, uh, but we recognize that uh, within the human uh, folk uh, exists this need to uh, maintain uh, ancestral ways of living uh, in location, right? And that uh, our sorts of interruptions within that flow of lives cannot be just an extractive operation uh, that the university is in many ways and forms and that we have to return some somehow that by working with them uh, uh, at the site by building 
spaces of collaboration uh, by uh, recognizing those embodied uh, forms of knowledge production uh, at the same level of the work we do. Uh, then it's just processes of humility and in that process also uh, re trying to reconstitute the notion of the university and humanities and social sciences as, as they are uh, uh, ways of encountering uh, and being amused and, and, and connect uh, one another, right? In, in, in a, in try to get, do better for, for them and for us in particular. I think us here are the ones that are suffering this disconnection. Uh, here, us, uh, you know, somehow captured by this third nature, right? This virtual world, this hyper mediation then when we go and work with communities uh, then everything is, uh, uh, is, is, is is fresh and, and, and new again then i think that's what i can say um i don't know if somebody else is aiming to speak next but i I just wanted to note to build on what Miguel said, I just really appreciated how we each spoke about um, epistemology in different ways and in relation to our institutions and the places where we are, but also the futures in which we imagine ourselves and the worlds that we think about and talk about. And I think um, Willie's work really struck me in the way that you phrased talking about epistemologies of violence and thinking about the relationship between um, white ignorance, white rage, white violence against black people. And in the context, I think that has so much resonance in thinking about some of the bigger themes across our papers, like development, like extraction um, in the um, figurative sense, as well as in the literal sense of extracting things from the earth. So I just, I, I really wanted to say, I appreciated that. Um, and I find myself including my experience in the classroom at MPP in most of the talks that I give. And I realize that as a teacher and as a scholar, that's been one of the most formative experiences of my life, despite having been in grad school for ever so many years and teaching for ever so many years. That year that I spent um, in the open air classroom in this agroecology training, continues to resonate with me so many years later and to pick up on Joel's theme of um, embodiment and experience. I think that's one way I keep coming back to it and trying to bring that into the kind of classrooms that we teach in in our home institutions can be challenging, but that's a goal that I have pedagogically that I think resonates across our talks. But certainly, I think that question of critical pedagogy is is one that resonates across all of the the talks. And thinking through, as well, um, praxis, right? Like the ways in which each of you are speaking to a different kind of form of praxis through the work that you're doing, and the ways in which you're representing that work, and and not only writing about collaborators, interlocutors, people, and places, but also trying to put forward a different way of thinking theoretically through action and impelling some sort of action through the work that you're doing and, and asking us to consider it. So I wanna thank you for that as well. Um, I'm gonna turn quickly to a question from, a, from our participant or some folks in the audience. So this is a question, I'm gonna kind of broaden it out. It's in imagining a future without extractive and unequal aspects of capitalism, how do we also make sure that, um, that folks across all classes, particularly uh, middle and lower classes are protected in the Americas? And the, so that's kind of a question that uh, is adapted from Yvette Rodriguez in the, in the chat. So I don't know if anybody is interested in, in kind of jumping on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, recently in Colombia was elected uh, uh, a new president uh, with a uh, clear uh, uh, program of decarbonization, right? That's the, 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 
the idea, right? Uh, decarbonization uh, and transitions, right? Transitions. And of course, is the first real uh, government of the left in a country that is, has been highly conservative and uh, plagued by, by uh, lots of violence. But he said something the first day when he was uh, being inaugurated, and he said, "We have to, in order to 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 do what we want to do, we have to achieve uh, capitalism." Then the the ideological discourses are again um, extractive, uh, right? The forms of of, of uh, the paths that we uh, had accepted as the right paths of uh, of growth, right, of, or well-being, not growth, of well-being are connected to economic growth and production. Uh, then there we have uh, an inner uh, contradiction, right? That is the contradiction of all these discourses of sustainable development, right? It's an inner contradiction to talk about development and sustainability as development and progress have clear uh, uh, markations of what they are and they, what they want to achieve. Then how to achieve what the, the person in the, in the chat is trying to question, right, is the question. Uh, when we go back and work with the communities, they don't talk about the future. I mean, this idea of futurologies is our, is our own construct, right? The idea of time that moves across the space and something is coming after, right? Is the issue of evolution, the teleologies. No, they think in terms of, of cycles. Uh, ancestrality is about cycles of return, right? It's about being in sync with, um, then in the colonial terms, uh, 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 these theories talk about uh, the unlinking, right? Uh, desenganche. Uh, how do you do that, of course, when you are within this context, uh, right? And with these uh, 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 forces, right, that has, you know, are push, pushing us as societies uh, towards destruction, right? What Benjamin used to say, by the way, are, this, this force that is called progress is like an explosion, and we just <laughs> see, <laughs> right? We are we are we are we are blind, right? Uh, uh, push towards somewhere that you don't know. It's just the debris of this explosion called progress that are pushing us, right? We're going blind. Uh, then what I can say to the to the, to the person making the question. There are there are other ways of being, right? But Arturo Score will say, I mean, there is a, there are other ontologies that there are people that live in other ways, right? Uh, and it's not about the poor uh, indigenous or the poor right people in the live. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of living that are dignified if we allow them to be and not try to bring them into this explosion of progress and what Petro said, uh, we have to become real capitalists in order to make the change happen. Yeah, if, if I could jump in, I, I think I might begin to attempt to answer the question in a, in a slightly different way, if, if also re related to Miguel, which is, which is to say that I would perhaps begin by, <clears throat> by kind of refusing, challenging, being a little hostile to some of the implication of the question itself, because I think that presupposes a kind of approach of thinking about transitions that is sort of still beholden to sort of racial capitalism or to the kinds of inequalities that we have, right? So, so I, I think I would begin by saying that I think part of the problem is having the kind of imagination in which the possibilities for an alternative are not measured against um, how much one group will be eliminated from benefits versus the other, but a kind of reality in which we do not begin with that assumption that in order, that, you know, we do not begin with a zero sum sort of prisoner's dilemma kind of framework. Because I, I think one of the, and I, I find myself increasingly saying this, one of the, I think, great victories of capitalism, racial capitalism and the kinds of inequality it allows to reproduce is the pretense that it has answered all of the questions and that this, in its answering the questions, what it has arrived at is the best model that we have, 
right? And, and so then um, any discussion of alternative needs to state up front the resolution of all of these possible problems, contradictions, which exist only sort of prefiguratively because we are beholden to the sort of capitalist model that we have as the way of thinking. So I, I want to begin in that kind of way and to suggest that I, I think that there are a whole host of existing practices across the region which provide the seeds from which we can begin to build alternatives. And I say alternatives because I am also maybe maybe and this is to maybe the the the, the question posers you know uh, point that if we presume that there is one Latin American model, one Latin American and perhaps then add on Caribbean model, then we are already reproducing the kinds of problems we're escaping. So I think maybe the opening for an alternative begins with the recognition of uh, pluriversality, right? Uh, the, the the possibilities for di for for diverse social models steeped in care that are not concerned with the retention of private property as the ultimate hegemonic structure uh, around which we organize life. I hope that makes sense. Be because well I, I done. Think, I think if we if we begin in that way, um, then we get to the kind of um, radical imaginary or imagination right that 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 makes these systems work how they need to in the spaces that they need to and i'm always and this is the last thing i say i'm always reminded of the radical potential of the slave plot the food provision ground and i, I think that that for example remains uh, an enduring symbol of the potentialities that can exist in critique of capitalism, racial capitalism, sort of plantocratic capitalism, while not sort of um, all at once and in one fell swoop undermining those systems, right? But sort of providing the space for the performance and experimentation of possibilities that might allow us to, to start thinking about what is possible, right? Thank you so we much. Are, we are approaching the end of our webinar. I just want to give Willie a moment to comment if, if you have anything else to add before I close this out, Willie. No, I think Dr. Moulton and Dr. Rojas Sotelo, you know, handled it very well. Thank you. Well, thank you to our moderator, Joel Correa, and to each of our panelists for sharing your work and for this conversation. And thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities for making this event possible through its grant program, Sustaining the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan. A recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, Florida Press. A link to the recording will be sent to all webinar registrants within the next few days. On our YouTube channel, you can also view a recording of the first event in this series, African Diasporic Arts and Social Change. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, um, but to receive updates and registration information for future webinars in this virtual event series, please visit upress.ufl.edu and sign up for our NEH Sharp event series email list. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful evening.